Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to Teen Book Tuesday. My name is Lori, and I am the teen librarian at Manlius Library, coming to you from my bright green teen room. And this week, in celebration of the new year, I'm going to present my five favorite episodes of 2020's Teen Book Tuesdays. We're gonna count down from number five, and the fifth book is Dreaming Darkly by Caitlin Kittredge. It's a gothic mystery. And it really was something that surprised me how much I enjoyed it last year. So here is Dreaming Darkly by Caitlin Kittredge. Dreaming Darkly by Caitlin Kittredge. It's a YA gothic horror that has a bit of a mystery twist in it as well. The main character is Ivy Bloodgood. She's 16 years old and her mother is dead. She feels like she should probably be sad about that, but she's really not. Her mother, Myra, was manipulative and a liar. She never told her the truth about anything, not who her family is, not who her father is, not where she comes from, and certainly she never told her anything about the curse on her family. Now, Ivy's been sent to live at Bloodgood Manor on Darkhaven, which is an island off the coast of Maine. She's living with her Uncle Simon and his housekeeper, Mrs. McLeod. They share the island with the Ramsey family, and the two families are sworn enemies and have been for generations. Of course, as soon as, my, as soon as Ivy gets to the island, she meets Doyle, Doyle Ramsey. He's also 17, and they start to develop kind of an uneasy friendship. Doyle knows some of the secrets. He knows about the history of the families, and he knows about the curse. Ivy starts to have unexplained blackouts. She has strange dreams. She wakes up in places she doesn't remember getting to. She learns about the family curse, and she also learns about the legends of murder and treasure. Dreaming Darkly is a very haunting, atmospheric novel. Let's read a little bit. Prologue. I was eight years old when my mother tried to kill me. One night, when we stopped outside Topeka, she held my head under the water of our motel room bathtub. I remember how warm her hands felt on the back of my neck and how the water chilled my skin. I heard nothing except the beating of my own heart. I don't remember feeling afraid. I don't remember feeling anything. When I woke up on the bathroom floor, my mother was gone. She came back later that night, sat on the sticky bedspread in our motel room, and cried. I've heard lots of theories since then from school counselors and child shrinks about why mothers try to hurt their children. But that night, her tear-stained face and heartbroken sobs told me everything. There was something wrong with me, something bad in my blood, under my skin, deep as my bones, something unnatural, something as dark and cold as the water I'd almost drowned in. And my mother knew it. So, Dreaming Darkly by Caitlin Kittredge. It's a perfect novel for someone who likes a fast-paced story, but with a dark and atmospheric setting and tone. There's a bit of a mystery, there's a little bit of horror, and there's quite a bit of... Coming in at number four for 2020 is The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. It's a mystery and an adventure. It's wrapped up in codes and secret passages and a giant old estate house, and it was wonderful. So number four, The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. This week, I'm going to tell you about a book that I loved but had never heard of. It's called The Inheritance Games, and it's by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. She's written some other some other YA books, but she'd never really been on my radar. Then this book started getting some good reviews, so I ordered it for the teen room. And then when it came in, I started to read it, and I instantly fell in love. It's about Avery. She has a plan for her future. Her mother is dead. Her father has disappeared. It's just she and Libby, her, her um, half-sister who are trying to survive, living day to day. Sometimes she's living in her car. She just wants to get through high school, win a scholarship, because her grades are good, and get out. But then her fortunes change like that. Let's find out how. By the time I returned to the great room, Jameson Hawthorne had miraculously managed to find a shirt and a suit jacket. He smiled in my direction and gave a little salute. Beside him, Grayson stiffened, his jaw muscles tensing. Now that everyone is here, one of the lawyers said, let's get started. 
The three lawyers stood in triangle formation. The one who'd spoken shared Alyssa's dark hair, brown skin, and self-assured expression. I assumed he was the Ortega in McNamara, Ortega, and Jones. The other two, presumably Jones and McNamara, stood to either side. Since when does it take four lawyers to read a will, I thought. You are here, Mr. Ortega said, projecting his voice to the corners of the room, to hear the last will and testament of Tobias Tattersall Hawthorne. Per Mr. Hawthorne's instructions, my colleagues will now distribute letters he has left for each of you. The other men began to make the rounds of the room, handing out envelopes one by one. You may open these letters when the reading is concluded. I was handed an, em handed an envelope. My full name was written in calligraphy on the front. Beside me, Libby looked up at the lawyer, but he passed over her and went on delivering envelopes to the other occupants of the room. Mr. Hawthorne stipulated that all of the following individuals must be physically present for the reading of the will. Sky Hawthorne, Zara Hawthorne Caligaris, Nash Hawthorne, Grayson Hawthorne, Jameson Hawthorne, Alexander Hawthorne, and Ms. Avery Kylie Grams of Newcastle, Connecticut. I felt about as conspicuous as I would have if I'd looked down and discovered I wasn't wearing clothes. Since you're all here, Mr. Ortega continued, we may begin. Beside me, Libby slipped her hand into mine. I, Tobias Tattersall Hawthorne, Mr. Ortega read, being of sound body and mind, decree that my worldly possessions, including all monetary and physical assets, be, di be disposed of as follows. To Andrew and Lottie Laughlin, for years of loyal service, I bequeath a sum of $100,000 apiece, with a lifelong rent-free tenancy granted at Wayback Cottage, located on the western border of my Texas estate. The older couple I'd early, earlier leaned into, I'd seen earlier leaned into each other. All I could think was $100,000. The Laughlin's presence wasn't mandatory for the reading of the will, and they'd just been given $100,000 a piece. I tried very hard to remember how to breathe. To John Oren, my head of, head of my security detail, who has saved my life more times and in more ways than I can count, I leave the contents of my toolbox held currently in the offices of McNamara, Ortega, and Jones, as well as a sum of $300,000. Tobias Hawthorne knew these people, I told myself, heart thumping. They worked for him. They mattered to him. I'm nothing. To my mother-in-law, Pearl O'Day, I leave an annuity of $100,000 a year, plus a trust for medical expenses as set forth in the appendix. All jewelry belonging to my late wife, Alice O'Day Hawthorne, shall pass to her mother upon my death to be distributed as she, to, as she sees fit upon hers. Nan harumphed. Don't you go getting any ideas, she ordered the room at large. I'm going to outlive you all. Mr. Ortega smiled. But then that smile faltered. To, he paused and then tried again. To my daughters. Zara Hawthorne Caligaris and Sky Hawthorne, I leave the funds necessary to pay off all debts accrued as of the date and time of my death. Mr. Ortega paused again, his lips pushing themselves together. The other two lawyers stared straight ahead, avoiding looking at any member of the Hawthorne family directly. Additionally, I leave to Sky my compass, may she always know true north, and to Zara I leave my wedding ring, May she love as wholly and steadfastly as I loved her mother. Another pause, more painful than the last. Go on, that came from Zara's husband. To each of my daughters, beyond that already stated, I leave a one-time inheritance of $50,000. $50,000? I'd no sooner thought those words than Zara's husband echoed them out loud, irate. Tobias Hawthorne left his daughters less than he left his security detail. Suddenly, Skye's reference to Grayson as their heir apparent took on a whole new meaning. You did this, Zara turned to Skye. She didn't raise her voice, but it was deadly all the same. Me, Skye said, Sky said, indignant. Daddy was never the same after Toby died, Zara continued. Disappeared, Skye corrected. God, listen to you. Zara lost hold on her tone. You got it in his head, didn't you, Skye? Batted your eyelashes and convinced him to bypass us and leave everything to your sons, Skye said. The word you're looking for is sons. 
The word she's looking for is bastards. Nash Hawthorne had the thickest Texas accent of anyone in the room. Not like we hadn't heard it before. If I'd had a son, Zara's voice caught. But you didn't. Sky let that sink in. Did you, Zara? Enough. Zara's husband stepped in. We will sort this out. I'm afraid there's nothing to be sorted. Mr. Ortega re-entered the fray. You will find the will of... You will find the will is ironclad with significant disincentives to any who might be tempted to challenge it. I translated that to mean roughly, shut up and sit down. Now, if I may continue, Mr. Ortega looked back at the will in his hands. To my grandsons, Nash Westbrook Hawthorne, Grayson Davenport Hawthorne, James Winchester Hawthorne, and Alexander Blackwood Hawthorne, I leave everything, Zara muttered briefly. Mr. Ortega spoke over her. $250,000 a piece, payable on their 25th birthdays, until such time to be managed by Alyssa Ortega, trustee. What? Alyssa sounded shocked. I mean, what the hell? Nash told her pleasantly. The phrase you're looking for, darling, is what the hell? Tobias Hawthorne hadn't left everything to his grandsons. Given the scope of his fortune, he'd left them a pittance. What is going on here? Grayson asked, each word deadly and precise. Tobias Hawthorne didn't leave everything to his grandsons. He didn't leave everything to his daughters. My brain ground to a halt right there. My ears rang. Please, everyone, Mr. Ortega held up a hand. Allow me to finish. $46.2 billion, I thought, my heart attacking my ribcage and my mouth sandpaper dry. Tobias Hawthorne was worth $46.2 billion and he left his grandsons a million combined. A hundred thousand total to his daughters, another half million to his servants, an annuity for Nan. The math in this equation did not add up. It couldn't add up. One by one, the other occupants of the room turned to stare at me. The remainder of my estate, Mr. Ortega read, including all properties, money assets, and worldly possessions not otherwise specified, I leave to Avery Kylie Grahams. And that is the start of the inheritance games. He left her his whole fortune, but there is a catch. Avery doesn't know him. He has no, she has no idea who he is, why ever he would leave the fortune to her. Her letter, when she opens it, simply says, I'm sorry and it's from Tobias. So the catch really is to receive her inheritance, she has to move into this sprawling, secret passage-filled Hawthorne house where every room bears the old man's touch and his love of puzzles and riddles and codes. She gets caught up in this world of wealth and privilege with danger around every turn. Of course, Tobias's actual relatives hate the fact and don't know why Avery has been left all of this entire fortune and estate, but there's a part of the will that says if they try to contest it, they get nothing and they're removed from the, from the estate. So they have to at least pretend to go along with it. She gets caught up in this world where she has to play this game just to survive, much less to get the, the uh, inheritance. And of course, not everybody is gonna be on her side, but also not everybody is against her. The problem is she needs to figure out who is who and who is actually on her side. It's fast paced, suspenseful, and tons of fun. It's the start of a new series. It's filled with riddles and clues and secrets and puzzles and lots of twists and turns. This is great for teens who grew up loving the twisty puzzle books like the mixed up files of Mrs. Baisley Frankenweiler and the Westing game, and even things like Encyclopedia Brown where it, the clues are there and you just have to try to figure it out. And teens who are now fans of the Truly Devious series, One of Us is Lying, um, and series like that. Even the movie Knives Out or The Game Among Us. This is a great one. I highly recommend it. It's called The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. Oh, and it's got a beautiful cover, which as you know, is always a plus for me. Coming in at number three this year is something a little different for me. I'm not usually a big reader of realistic fiction, but I'm Not Dying With You Tonight by Kimberly Jones and Jilly Seagal was fabulous. It's realistic fiction about two high school girls from completely different worlds that have to come together 
to survive just one night. Today I'm here to talk to you about the realistic fiction book, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, by Kimberly Jones and Gilly Seagal. This is the story of Lena and Campbell. They're two high school girls, they're seniors in Atlanta, but they're not friends. They know each other, but they couldn't be more different. They are from completely different backgrounds. They have different social status, both in the school and in the community, different personalities, and just different. Lena grew up in Atlanta, African-American girl. She has killer style, confidence to the moon. She has an awesome boyfriend, kind of a secret boyfriend, and a plan for the future. Lena knows where she's going. Campbell is a Caucasian girl. She transplanted from Pennsylvania. Her mom got a job in Venezuela, so she had to go live with her dad. She's the new girl at school, and as a senior, that's extra difficult. She just wants to get through the year. She doesn't know really what she's gonna do for the future. She's just trying to keep her head down and make it through her senior year. So here we are at the biggest football game of the season. It's a big rivalry and it's not a friendly one. Both girls are there. Lena's there with her friends, hoping to meet up with her boyfriend later. And Campbell is there because she kind of got finagled into working for this in the, at the concession stand in the snack shack. Uh, after the game, a fight breaks out. It quickly escalates. Somebody is shot, the police are called, and then it just turns into a mass of riots and looting and fighting and fires and protests. And the girls do manage to escape the campus, but they find themselves in the middle of Atlanta, in the middle of a huge riot. And they have to rely on each other and navigate their own differences to survive the night. It's really a book about forging friendships through adversity. I'm gonna read you a little bit from it, just the first two quick chapters, so that you can kind of get to know who the two girls are. We didn't understand that the riots had begun. Bart Bartholomew, New York Times photographer and the only professional journalists in journalist in South Central Los Angeles when rioting broke out following the Rodney King verdict. Part one, mass disturbance. Chapter one, Lena, McPherson High School. Waiting for black is on your agenda, not mine, Lashonda barks as we leave the building. I ain't think she was gonna wait. No way, that ain't what I was anticipating. I know she's got responsibilities at home, but I knows I hate sitting out here by myself. If you ask me, this is really about her hating on Black, as usual. It don't cost you nothing to walk away, I snap back. Lashonda cackles. Can your grandfather stop speaking through your body? I don't know what you're talking about. I flip my hair over my shoulder, but she got me laughing like she always does. Pop's got all the best sayings. She shakes her head and then looks down at my feet. Anyway, I see you got them. A big smile takes over my face. Lashonda never misses anything I do. She knows me, like really knows me, and she knew that statement would perk up both our moods. They cute, right? Lady, you know they better than cute. They are fire, best friend. If I thought I could cram my size tens into them, I'd be trying to borrow them ASAP, Lashonda says. I saw some size tens in a different style as cute as these. Let me turn a few more checks and I'm gonna hook you up. Go, best friend. That's my best friend, she sings, and we both laugh. Her granny, Miss Ann House, is really her house. Miss Ann works two jobs and drives for Uber. Lashonda does all the laundry, cooking, and watching her three bad little cousins. Even though she works real hard, she's not able to have an after-school job or anything. That's why I love splurging on a pair of fly shoes for her when I can. I like being that person in her life who gives her the little extras. So are we going to this game slash fundraiser slash turn up slash piped up lituation? Yes, ma'am. You know, if we don't see the dolls dance at halftime, they'll kill us. You ain't never lied, Lashonda winks. Nana, let me get out of here before Graham kills me. Okay, but don't flake tonight. Anyway, it's okay she has to go. Some days you just want to be alone with your man. And for me, this is one of those days. I've been missing him. He's been grinding so hard lately that we never get to see each other. He always smells good enough to eat. He puts aftershave right on his neck, too, because he knows how I like to rest my head on his shoulder and just breathe him in. Oh, that man does something to me. 
He makes my head spin. I'm so caught up thinking about his fine self that I don't notice Lashonda walking away till she loves back till she yells back at me. Love you later. Love you later, I shout. She hates goodbye. That's the last thing her mom said to her before she passed away from a heroin overdose. She's never said the word goodbye to anyone since. I think about texting Black, but that will only aggravate him. I know he's coming, and he always says what's understood doesn't need to be said. Not a minute later, he pulls up, bumping the new Kalechi album as loud as he can. He has such amazing taste in music. He can't stand trap music and only listens to real MCs who don't do all that person and hating on women. Did somebody request an Uber? He smiles, leaning toward the passenger window. I did. I hit the button for cute, so I wasn't expecting fine. Is it the same fee? Uber black is usually a little more, but I lower the rate when the rider is fine, too. We both laugh, and I get in. I lean over to hug him, and he smells good as I expected. I almost don't want to let go. I lift my face for him to kiss me and melt into him. His soft lips press against mine, and it feels like sun's rays warming my skin. I gently pull away. I need to go home and get myself together to be cute at the football game tonight. The game? He starts the car and pulls out. Since when is that something you do? My girl's doing the halftime, and I'm a good friend, jerk. I push his shoulder playfully. But you know, I don't plan on staying longer than their show, so I'll have some free time left before curfew. Okay, well, I'm going to see how I'm moving tonight, and, you know, I'll let you know what I'm doing. So that's a no, I say, feeling my mouth twist up. I didn't say no. You didn't have to, I say. I guess we'll see, won't we? We pull up a few doors from my house, and I let him kiss me goodbye. Bye, Black. Later, beautiful. I roll my eyes as I get out of the car. I walk in my house and head to the kitchen for a snack. What you doing? Pops asks, not looking up from the sink as he washes plates. I have no idea why my grandfather won't use the dishwasher. I refuse to hand wash dishes. My nail's too delicate to be ruined by palm olive. Just making a snack before I get ready for the game. I sigh. Black usually leaves me in the most amazing mood, except for when he plays like Han Hansel, leaving me crumbs. What's got you down in the mouth? Pops, you ain't even looked at me. No need to. I can hear it. I reckon it's because of that little knucklehead you just got out of the car with. Pops, I didn't... He interrupts. Go to Lion, and the only game you're going to see tonight is Wheel of Fortune on the Game Show Network. If you had a nice boy, there wouldn't be no need to lie. No, if you gave him a chance, I'd have no need to lie. But if I said that out loud, he'd pop me in the mouth. Am I excused? Go on, little liar on the prairie. I don't care what Pop says, as long as he don't say I can't go to the game. I'm going to try to hook up with Black later. I think tonight can end better than we just left it at the car. Chapter 2. Campbell, McPherson High School football field. My dad's truck rumbles into the school parking lot at the same time as the bus carrying the opposing team. We squeeze into a space at the very end of a row. It's good you're doing this, Campbell. Dad says as the bus empties and a long line of beefy football guys in track suits lumber out. Is it? I stay in my seat, remain buckled. I wonder why he thinks it matters if I work the concession stand for one game at this school. I'll only be here a year, my senior year. Where does he think this one night is going to lead? While players head through a gate in the chain link fence toward the locker rooms, another bus pulls up and hems us in. This one lets out a load of cheerleaders, a dance team, and some boosters. The Panthers and their entourage fill the parking lot. According to what our principal said on the morning announcements, Jonesville is McPherson's biggest rival, ranked one beneath us in the standings, or something. I guess they would bus us I guess they would bus in a big crowd for such an important game. The only people around seem to be Jonesville fans. You'd think McPherson fans would have shown up by now to cheer on the home team as the most important game of the season. Then again, the principal made a big deal about expecting extra security and demanding we all be on our best behavior tonight. So I'm guessing the rivalry gets pretty intense. Maybe it's better if the Jonesville superfans are settled on the visitor side of the stadium before the home crowd shows. I look around for people I might know, then realize that's ridiculous. I don't know anybody here. The human throng before us parts, allowing a tall woman with waist-length braids to make her way through. 
She struggles to pull, push a dolly in front of her with one hand and drag a battered red wagon behind her with the other. Both are heaped with cardboard boxes. That's Ms. Marino, I say. She coaches the dance team, teaches my English class, and invited me to work the concession stand tonight. I unbuckled my seatbelt and hop out of the car to help her. To my surprise, my dad jumps out too. Campbell, she exclaims, so glad you decided to come. I can't think why I did. Ms. Marino explained that this year, the proceeds from the concession stand sales will be used to fund renovations to upgrade the rest of the athletic facilities. So they'll be as nice as the fancy new football field. The only catch is the teams have to man the stand. Of course, as the athletes are too busy during games to work the booth, they've been asking for volunteers. I didn't raise my hand when Ms. Marino asked, believe me. No one did, even though she practically begged for help every single day this week. The entire class dodged her. The awkward silences that followed her more and more desperate requests made me squirm. That's probably why, when she caught me as the bell rang, this morning and asked if I'd ever run concessions before, the word yes came out faster than an excuse. My dad takes the dolly. I hoist a couple of boxes off the top of the wagon and we follow her toward the main gate. She leads us past two dance team members raising a glittery support field renovations banner up to the top of the fence. Good job, girls, she calls. Finish hanging that and I'll meet you in the locker room in 10 minutes for warm ups. The familiar ring of a coach giving orders makes me flinch. Words like those reverberated through my nights and weekends once, back when I used to be on a team. I look quickly away from the girls and their mascot logo warm-up suits and scurry after my dad and Ms. Marino. The huge concrete stadium looms above us, casting a shadow over the concession stand, which is a relief. There's a good couple of hours of daylight left, and this wooden booth will be enough of a sauna without sitting in the middle of a sunbeam. The shade is the only thing to get excited about. Otherwise, the concession stand is a disaster. A rickety box built of plywood and two by fours with big windows on one side covered by a rolling metal security grill and below them, a lip of wood that juts out and is probably supposed to be the service counter. Ms. Marino dials the combination of a padlock hooked onto a hasp near the top of the door, slides it off, and yanks the door open. The knob wobbling loosely in her hands. With her, my dad, me, and the dolly, the booth is crowded to capacity. A third of the boxes and the wagons are still outside. How is this going to work? I don't point that out, though. I just help ferry the boxes. My dad stays long enough to help cram all the supplies into the concession stand. Okay, he says, when the last packages have been shoved into cabinets. I'll see you after the game, Campbell. Pick you up right outside the gate. You know, Ms. Marino says, the dance team always celebrates at Mr. Suvlaki's after home games. I think after working the booth for us tonight, you've earned honorary team member status. You should come with us. I'm stunned. I don't really know any of the girls. She smiles gently. This is how you get to know them. Mr. Suvlaki's? Dad frown, Dad's frown lines cut deep into his face as he considers this invite. That Greek place up on Woodland Street? Yes, Mrs. Marino says, Ms. Marino says, pizza's perfect, cokes are cold, and they're both cheap. And I'll be there, as will both our team moms. Plenty of adult supervision, if that's what you're worried about. Campbell, I was planning on heading up to the cabin right after the game. I'm not thrilled about getting up there that late, says Dad. He sets a hand on my shoulder, like his trip is breaking news to me, like I'm disappointed and need comforting. You're going out of town? Ms. Marino asks, deflating. Just him. but He's my ride home, so... I feel a strange mix of regret and relief churning around in my stomach. Maybe another time? Oh, she says, her smile back and beaming. That's no problem. I can drive you home after dinner. What? No, 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 no. As if being the new girl isn't pathetic enough, now Ms. Marino is my ride? Dad says slowly, that could work. If I leave now, I'll reach the cabin before it gets too dark. I protest, but in vain. My teacher and my father lock down my Friday night plans and he happily heads off to his fishing cabin. And before I can even make sense of how it happened, I'm escorting Ms. Marino as she goes to get more supplies. And that is a brief introduction to Lena and Campbell.
This is a very fast-paced novel, highly recommended for fans of realistic fiction, urban fiction, books about friends. Lena and Campbell are two very different characters. It is written by Kimberly Jones and Gilly Segal. The title is I'm Not Dying With You Tonight, and I think you'll really like it. Give it a chance. My number two book this year is one I waited with cautious optimism for. It's The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins, and it's the prequel to the very popular Hunger Games series. Um, it's the story of how President Snow becomes President Snow. And it took me by surprise how much I enjoyed it. I was, as I said, I went in with some cautious optimism and I really liked it. So that's The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins at number two. Today I'm gonna to tell you about a book that just came out last week and I read it as soon as it released. It's called The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. And it's a Hunger Games novel. But instead of continuing on with the story from Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and Mockingjay, Mockingjay, um, we're going back. We're going way back, almost to the beginning of the Hunger Games, to the reaping of the 10th annual Hunger Games, where we meet a young Coriolanus Snow. He's 18. He's a senior in high school at the Academy, the school to attend in the capital. He's capital born and bred, and now he's fighting for the life that he's always dreamed of and that he's always been told was his by right. His family fell on hard times during the war. They made some bad business decisions and lost most of their money. So now they're putting up this huge front to try to convince everybody that they're still the wealthy and entitled family that they've always been through history. And now it's the day of the reaping. There's a new program. Seniors at the Academy have been selected, 24 of them, and each of them will be assigned one of the tributes from the districts to be a mentor. Unfortunately, Coriolanus does not get a very good selection. Let's find out what happens. We'll meet Coriolanus and we'll meet his tribute. The District 12 girl? Could there be a bigger slap in the face? District 12, the smallest district, the joke district, with its stunted joint joint swollen kids that always died in the first five minutes. And not only that, but the girl? Not that a girl couldn't win, but in his mind, the Hunger Games were largely about brute force and the girls were naturally smaller than the boys and therefore at a disadvantage. Coriolanus had never been a particular favorite of Dean Highbottom, who he jokingly, call, jokingly called high as a kite bottom among his friends, but he had not expected such a public humiliation. Had the nickname gotten back to him? Or was this just an acknowledgement that in the new world order, the snows were fading from in, fading into insignificance? He could feel the blood burning in his cheeks as he tried to remain composed. Most of the other students had risen and were chatting among themselves. He must join them, pretend this was of no consequence, but he seemed incapable of movement. The most he could manage was to turn his head to the right, where Sejanus still sat beside him. Coriolanus opened his mouth to congratulate him, but stopped at the barely concealed misery on the other boy's face. What is it? he asked. Aren't you happy? District 2! The boy, that's the pick of the litter. You forget, I'm part of that litter, said Sejanus hoarsely. Coriolanus let that sink in. So, 10 years in the capital and the privileged life it provided had been wasted on Sejanus. He still thought of himself as a district citizen. Sentimental nonsense. Sejanus's forehead creased in consternation. I'm sure my father requested it. He's always trying to get my mind right. <laughs> no doubt, thought Coriolanus. Old Strabo Plinth's deep pockets and influence were respected if his lineage was not. And while the mentorships were supposedly based on merit, strings clearly had been pulled. The audience had settled into seats now. At the back of the dais, curtains parted to reveal a floor to ceiling screen. Sorry, to reveal a floor to ceiling screen. The reaping aired live from each district, moving from the East Coast to the West, and was broadcast around the country. That meant District 12 would kick off the day. Everyone rose as the seal of Pan Am filled the screen, accompanied by the Capitol Anthem. 
Some of the students fumbled for the words, but Coriolanus, who had heard his grandmother butcher it daily for years, sang all three verses in a forceful voice, garnering a few nods of approval. It was pathetic, but he needed every drop of approval he could get. The seal dissolved to show President Ravenstill, his hair streaked with silver, dressed in his pre-war military uniform as a reminder that he'd been controlling the districts long before the dark days of the rebellion. He recited a brief passage from the Treaty of Treason, which laid out the Hunger Games as a war reparation, young district lives taken for the young capital lives that had been lost, the price of the rebels' treachery. The game makers cut to the bleak square of District 12, where a temporary stage, now lined with peacekeepers, had been erected before the Justice Building. Mayor Lip, a squat, freckled man in a hopelessly outdated suit, stood between two burlap sacks. He dug his hand deeply into the bag on the left, pulled out a slip of paper, and barely glanced at it. The District 12 girl tribute is Lucy Gray Baird, he said into a mic. The camera swept over the crowd of gray, hungry faces in gray, shapeless clothing, seeking the tribute. It zoomed in toward a disturbance, girls drawing back from the unfortunate chosen one. The audience gave a surprised murmur at the sight of her. Lucy Gray Baird stood upright in a dress made of a rainbow of ruffles, now raggedy but once fancy. Her dark curly hair was pulled up and woven with limp wildflowers. Her colorful ensemble drew the, drew the eye as to a tattered butterfly in a field of moths. She did not make straight for the stage, but began to weave through the girls off to her right. It happened quickly. The dip of her hand into the ruffles at her hip, the wriggle of a bright green, the wriggle of bright green transported from her pocket and deposited down the collar of a smirking redhead's blouse, the rustle of her skirt as she moved on. Focus stayed on the victim, her smirk changing to an expression of horror, her shrieks as she fell to the ground, pawing at her clothes, the shouts of the mayor. And in the background, her assailant was still weaving, still gliding her way to the stage, not looking back even once. And that is Coriolanus Snow and Lucy Gray Baird, his District 12 female tribute. So that's Lucy Gray Baird. And Coriolanus Snow has the seemingly impossible task of mentoring her through the Hunger Games, hopefully to a win. The mentor of the winning tribute will receive a full ride scholarship to university. And if Coriolanus is going to make any of his dreams, any of what he's been told is his to do, if he's going to make any of that come true, he needs to win that scholarship because otherwise there's no way that he's going to be able to even go to university. So, if you've read the Hunger Games novels, you can jump right in. No worries, and this will be a great reintroduction to the series. If you haven't read the Hunger Games novels, you can do it in one of two orders, and it doesn't really matter. There's no spoilers in this book. You can start with A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and read up on a little bit of the history of it, or you can put a hold on Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and start with the Hunger Games. Read through the Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and Mockingjay, and then go into the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. This is a great introduction to the origins and the history of some of the most memorable parts of the Hunger Games. Some of the good and some of the bad. And a lot of the weird. A little bit of the scientific. You'll meet people who you th saw glimpses of for the, through the first three books, if you've read them. If you haven't read them, it's a great introduction to the whole entire series, to the world. It's a great world-building and character-building book. It's also a wonderful inside story of how Coriolanus Snow becomes, well, no spoilers, how he becomes who he becomes. I think that this is a great book choice for anybody to read, and I hope that you enjoy it. And finally, my favorite book of the year, which really didn't come as much of a surprise, it was also my most anticipated book of the year, was The Left-Handed Booksellers of London by Garth Nix. It is a fantasy, it is a mystery, it's an adventure, it takes us into different worlds, there's a bit of a portal fantasy, it really has everything that I absolutely love in a book. And that is The Left-Handed Booksellers of London by Garth Nix, my number one pick for the year. Hi everybody and welcome to this week's Teen Book Tuesday. Today I have a book to tell you about that I have been waiting for all year. It may be the one I am most excited about for the entire 
year. It's called The Left-Handed Booksellers of London, and it's by Garth Nix. You may recognize him as the author of books like Angel Mage and Frog Kisser. He also wrote the Old Kingdom series, and several years ago, he wrote the Keys to the Kingdom series, which is where I first discovered him. If you haven't read those, I recommend you go back and read those. But today I'm going to tell you about The Left-Handed Booksellers of London. It's about Susan. It takes place in an alternate 1983 London. So kind of historical fiction, but not really. She's searching for the father that she never met and she gets drawn into this extended family of magical left-handed fighting booksellers who police intruders from the mythical old world of England. It sounds complicated and it can be, but it's really interesting. Okay, maybe interesting isn't the right word. Maybe fascinating is the right word. It's exciting, it's thrilling, it's funny. It's got a bit of a mystery to it. Let's see, she's just turning 18. She wants to be an artist. So she leaves home to go to school in London and to research her father's identity. Chronically dreamy and detached, her mother, Jasmine, has always been pretty tight-lipped about the matter. She never told her anything about her father who he was, where he came from, how they met, where he might be now. So when she's visiting a family friend in London, she witnesses his death, his murder, and joins a mysterious young man in flight from supernatural old world creatures. She quickly realizes that some power is determined to stop her from solving the puzzle of her father. And so she gives in to the weirdness and teams up with her left-handed escape partner, Merlin, his right-handed sister, Vivian, to find some answers. With the help of the siblings' bookseller organization, it's a secret organization, the, the three of them embark on a quest for information that will take them across 1980s England and through a very, a series of really weird in-between spaces. It's great. I'm gonna read you the first couple of chapters. This story takes place in a version of England in the year 1983, but it is not entirely as those who were alive then will remember, or those with a historical bent can check up on, but which is real. I was alive in 1983 and I can tell you, this is not how I remember 1983. Now I wasn't in London in 1983, but prologue. It was 5.42 a.m. on May Day, 1983, in the west of England, and a sliver of the sun had edged above the ridge. But it was still cool and almost dark in the shallow valley, where the brook ran clear and straight until it made a sweeping left-hand curve before the weir a mile, a mile farther downstream. A bridge of three planks crossed the brook near a farmhouse, carrying the footpath to the farther side, diverting walkers away. Not that this path was ever well-traveled. Walkers somehow failed to see the start of this particular path, under the ancient oak next to the crossroad at the hamlet near the weir. A young woman came out of the farmhouse, yawning, her eyes half shut, her mind still mostly lost in a dream that had seemed so real. Susan Arkshaw, who had turned 18 years old as of two minutes ago, was, a, was striking rather than immediately attractive with her vibrant black eyebrows in stark contrast to her closely razored head, the stubble dyed white blonde. She wore a 1968 Jimi Hendrix summer tour t-shirt given to her mother 15 years ago by a roadie. The t-shirt was big enough to serve as a nightdress because she was not tall, though very wiry and muscular. People often thought she was a professional dancer or gymnast, though she was neither. Her mother, who was tall and slight without the muscle, said Susan took after her father, which was possibly true. Susan had never met him, and this was one of the few details her mother had ever shared. Susan walked to the brook and knelt to dip her hand in the cool, clear water. She'd had the recurring dream again, familiar since childhood. She frowned, trying to recall it in more detail. It always started the same way, here, at the brook. She could almost see it. A disturbance in the water suggested a fish rising at first, until it became a great roiling and splashing, too big for any fish. Slowly, as if drawn up by an invisible rope, a creature rose from the heart of the swift current in the middle of the brook. Its legs and arms and body were made from weed and water, 
willow sticks and reeds. Its head was a basket shaped of twisted alder roots with orbs of swirling water as limpid eyes, and its mouth was made of two good-sized crayfish, claws holding tails, crustacean bodies forming an upper and lower lip. Bubbling and streaming clear cold water, the creature sloshed a dozen yards across the grass and then stone paving to the house and raising one long limb, lashed green willow ends upon the window glass once, twice, three times. The crayfish mouth moved and the tongue of pondweed emerged to shape words, wet and sibilant. I watch and ward. The river creature turned and walking back lost height and girth and substance until in the last few paces, it became little more than a bundle of stuff such as the brook might throw ashore in a flood. The only sign of its presence, a trail of mud upon the flagstone path that lined the front of the house. Susan rubbed her temples and looked behind her. There was a trail of mud on the flagstones from house to brook, but her mother had probably gotten up even earlier and been pottering about shuffling in her gumboots. A raven cawed from the rooftop. Susan waved to it. There were ravens in her dream too, but much bigger ones, much larger than any that actually existed. And they talked as well, though she couldn't remember what they said. She always remembered the beginning of the dream best. It got confused after the brook creature. Beside the ravens, there was also something about the hill above the farmhouse. A creature emerged from the earth there kind of a lizard thing of stone, possibly a dragon? Hmm. Susan smiled, thinking about what all this meant. Her subconscious, hard at work at fantasizing, fueled by too many fantasy novels and a childhood diet of Susan Cooper, J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis. The brook creature and the huge ravens and the earth lizard should all make up a nightmare, but the dream wasn't frightening. Quite the reverse, in fact. She always felt strangely comforted after she had the dream. She yawned hugely and went back to bed. As she crawled under her duvet, her duvet and sleep claimed her again, she suddenly remembered what one of the huge ravens had said in her dream. Gifts your father gave us, we creatures of water, air, and earth, to watch and ward. My father, said Susan sleepily, my father. Later, when her mother brought her tea and toast in bed at eight o'clock, special treat to celebrate her birthday. Susan had forgotten her earlier awakening, had forgotten she had the recurring dream again. But something lingered, something she knew she'd dreamed. She looked at her mother sitting on the end of the bed. I had an interesting dream last night, I think. Only I can't remember what happened. It seemed important. It's good to dream, said her mother, who lived much in a dream herself. She ran her fingers through her long, luxuriantly black hair, streaked here and there with the white of grief, not age. Jasmine never let anyone cut her hair. She became very agitated when Susan suggested she do more than trim the ends, which she did herself. Most of the time, but there are bad dreams too. I think my dream, I think it was somehow about my father. Oh yes? More tea? Are you sure you can't tell me who my father is, Mum? Oh, no. It was a different time. I wasn't the same person. He... Did you say yes to more tea? Yes, Mum. They drank more tea, both, both lost in their own thoughts. Eventually, Susan said with some determination, I think I'll go up to London early. Get, ac get acclimatized. There's bound to be pub work I can get, and I... I'll try to find my dad. What was that, darling? I'm going to go up to London before I take my place. Just find some work and so on. Oh, well, it's natural, I suppose. But you must be careful. He told me, no, that was about something else. Who is he? What did he say to be careful of or about? Hmm? Oh, I forget. London, yes, of course you must go. When I was 18, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. But I insist on postcards. You must send me postcards. Trafalgar Square. Susan waited for Jasmine to continue, but her mother's voice trailed off and she was staring at the wall. Whatever thought had been about to emerge lost somewhere along the way.
I will, Mom. And I know you will be careful. 18. Happy birthday, my darling. Now, I must get back to my painting before that cloud comes over and ruins the light. Presents later, okay? After second breakfast? Presents later. Don't miss the light. No, no. You too, darling. Even more so for you. Be sure to stay in the light. That's what he would have wanted. Mom, who's he? Come back. Oh, never mind. Chapter one. A clerk there was, sinister gloved, dexter scorning, his sword well loved, wielded mirror wise, most adept, books and slaughter in both well kept. A slight young man with long, fair hair, wearing a pre-owned mustard-colored three-piece suit with widely flared trousers and faux alligator hide boots with two-inch Cuban heels, stood over the much older man on the, on the leather couch. The latter was wearing nothing but a monogrammed silk dressing gown, which had fallen open to reveal an expansive belly very reminiscent of a pufferfish. His fleshy face was red with anger, jowls still quivering with the shock of being stuck square on his roseate nose with a silver hat pin. You'll pay for this, you little, the old man swore, swiping with the cutthroat razor he'd just pulled from under one of the embroidered cushions on the couch. But even as he moved, his face lost rigidity, flesh collapsing like a plastic bag brushed against a candle flame. The young man, or perhaps it was a young woman who was dressed like a man, stepped back and watched as the tide of change continued the flesh within the pale blue robe falling into a fine, fine dust that ebbed away to reveal strangely yellowed bones poking from sleeves and collar, bone in its turn crumbling into something akin to finest sand, ground small over millennia by the mighty ocean. Though in this case it had not taken an ocean, nor millennia, merely the prick of a pin and a few seconds. Admittedly, a very special pin, although it looked like any other pin made for Georgian area ladies, Georgian era ladies. This one, however, was silver washed steel with Solomon's great spell of unmasking inscribed on it in letters too small for the unaided eye to see, invisible between the hallmarks that declared it to have been, ma been made in Birmingham in 1797 by Harshton and Houle. Very obscure silversmiths and not ones whose work was commonly sought after then or now. They mostly made hat pins after all and oddly sharp paper knives. The young man, for he was a young man, or tending towards being one, held the silver hat pin, in his, hat pin in his left hand, which was encased in a pale tan glove of very fine and supple cabretta leather, whereas the elegant figures of his right hand were free of any such covering. He wore a ring on the index finger of his right hand, a thin gold band etched with some inscription that would need very close examination to read. His gloved hand was per gloved left hand was perfectly steady as he slid the pin back into its special pocket in the right sleeve of his suit. Its head snug against the half sovereign cufflinks. 1897, Queen Victoria, the Jubilee year, not any old half sovereign, of his Turnbull and Asser shirt. His right hand shook a little as he did so, though not enough to make the hat pin snag a thread. The slight shake wasn't because he disincorporated crime boss Frank Thringley. It wasn't because it was because he wasn't supposed to be there at all, and he was wondering how he was going to explain, put, put your hands up. He also wasn't supposed to be able to be surprised by someone, like the young woman who had burst into the room an exacto craft knife in her trembling hands. She was neither tall nor short, and moved with a muscular grace that suggested she might be a martial artist, a martial artist or a dancer. Though her class t-shirt under dark blue overalls, oxblood Doc Martens, and her buzzed short dyed blonde hair suggested more of a punk musician or the like. The man raised his hands up level with his head. The knife wielder was one, young, perhaps his own age, which was 19, two, almost certainly not a sipper like Frank Thringley, and three, not the sort of young woman crime bosses usually kept around the house. What? What did you do to Uncle Frank? He's not your uncle. He slid one foot forward, but stopped as the young woman gestured with the knife. Well, no, but stay there. Don't move. I'm going to call the police. The police? Don't you mean Charlie Norton or Ben Bentnose or one of Frank's other charming associates? I mean the police, 
the young woman said determinedly. She edged across the telephone, edged across to the telephone on the dresser. It was a curious phone for Frank Thringley, Merlin thought. Antique art deco from the 1930s, little white ivory thing with gold inlay and a straight cord. Who are you? I mean, sure, go ahead and call the police, but we've probably only got about five minutes before, or less actually. He stopped talking and using his gloved left hand, suddenly drew a very large revolver from the tie-dyed woven yak hair shoulder bag he wore on his right side. At the same time, the young woman heard something behind her, something coming up the stairs, something that did not sound like normal fo footsteps. And she turned as a bug the size of a small horse burst through the room, burst into the room, and the young man stepped past her and fired three times, boom, 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 into the creature's thorax, sending spurts of black blood and fragments of chitin across the white obison carpet. Still it kept coming, its multi-segmented back legs scrabbling and its hooked forelibs snapping, almost reaching the man's legs until he fired again three more shots, boom, 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 and the huge ugly bug flipped over onto its back and spun about in frenzied death throes. As the deafening echoes of the gunshots faded, the woman realized she was screaming and stopped since it wasn't helping. What? What was that? Pediculus humanus capitus, a louse, replied the young man, who was reloading his revolver, hitching up his waistcoat to take rounds from a canvas bullet belt. Made bigger, obviously. We really have to go. Name's Merlin, by the by. Name's Merlin, by the by. Like Merlin the magician? Like Merlin the wizard. And you are? Susan, said Susan automatically. She stared at the still twitching giant louse on the carpet, then at the pile of reddish dust on the lounge contained by the pale blue robe. The monogram FT was uppermost, as if pointing out who the dust used to be. What the hell is going on? Can't explain here, said Merlin, who had gone to the window and was lifting the sash. Why not? asked Susan. Because we'll both be dead if we stay. Come on. He went out through the window. Susan looked at the phone and thought about calling the police. But after a single second more, a single second more of careful but lightning fast thought, she followed it. And so begins the adventure of Susan and Merlin through an alternate history 1983 London to find her father, which Merlin might actually be able to help her with, and to protect the world from supernatural old world England creatures. So while this is definitely a fantasy, it's also got a good deal of mystery in it. It's high, high adventure, and it is laugh out loud funny. Great for fans of the Hazelwood books, the girl who navigated fairyland in a ship of her own making, The Reader by Tracy Chi, um, The City of Bones series by Cassandra Clare, The Bartimaeus books by Jonathan Stroud, um, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children series. Fans of those will definitely love this book. And I am one who's hoping this is actually part of a series. I'm not sure about that. It's not listed as that, but I'm hoping that there's going to be more in this world to come. He nails the 1980s pop culture and also gets the alternate part right. So a great blend of all of those. So there you have it. My personal top five of 2020. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at some of the books that I read and hopefully that you read over the past year. Next week, I will be back with a brand new episode of Teen Book Tuesday featuring two books, a fiction and a nonfiction that work really well together to kind of lift spirits and move forward into a brand new year. Thanks for joining me. My name is Lori. I'm the teen librarian at Manlius Library. You can find me here every Tuesday at 4 p.m. on the Manlius Library YouTube channel. And you can find all of the past episodes as well. Those are all up there on our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me again. Have a great day. Have a great week and happy reading.